I'm here today with Laura Jonathan Sachs, um, professor at three universities, New York University, Yeshiva University, and King's College London. Uh, he is the chief rabbi emeritus of uh, United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth, and he's one of the most influential religious leaders today, along with figures like Dalai Lama or Pope Francis, and a major public intellectual. Rabbi Sachs will be a guest this afternoon in Life Worth Living seminar here at Yale University. And so we are here to talk about uh, his work and yes, also about life, about what does it mean to live a life that is worth living. Rabbi Sachs, it is a tremendous honor to have you here uh, with us today. Great to be with you. In this course that we teach Life Worth Living, we uh, differentiate three different dimensions of what we describe formally as life worth living. One is life going well, for one. Uh, the other one is life being led well. And the third is somehow life also feeling good. Mm -hmm. so, so let's start with the first one, mm -hmm. life going well. Mm -hmm. What needs to be there <clears throat> for life to go well for us? What kinds of circumstances do we need as human beings? Well, to be honest, I think Judaism would focus on the second question mm. first. Um, because the Jewish story uh, tends to begin with life not going well. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got Abraham at the beginning of the Jewish story being told to leave everything that makes him comfortable and feeling he belongs, his land, his birthplace, and his father's house. You have the great national story of the Jewish people set in Egypt, yeah. the Israelites are enslaved, and so on. So Judaism tends to be a journey from life not going well through to the question, what can we do? How shall we live? How can we rescue something from tragedy. So, you know, Judaism tends to be about um, turning bad circumstances into some kind of form of blessing. And this is the promise to Abraham. Mm. You will be blessed mm. and the nations will be blessed mm. to you. Would that be part of what it means for life to go well? Yeah. I suppose really the great, the great metaphors arising out of Abraham's life and Moses' life Abraham is the archetype of following the call yeah. and being willing to journey to an unknown land. In fact, that's one of the most beautiful lines in the Bible in Jeremiah chapter 2 when God says to the Israelites, who have hitherto been seen as a fairly fractious and rebellious bunch, he says, I remember the love of your youth, the kindness of our betrothal that you were willing to follow me through an unknown it's mm -hmm. unknown, unsown land. So um, for Abraham, it's following the call. For Moses and the Israelites, it's following the pillar of cloud by day and fire mm -hmm. by night across the wilderness. So I think the first metaphor about a life worth living is that a life worth living in Judaism is a journey. It's not a state of being. Judaism is about walking, about the way, about following the call of God. And of course, once we get to Moses and Jews as a people, not just as a family, there comes the second element, which is core to this, which is divine law. Mm -hmm. um, here is a it's nation. Kind of fleshed out, the call yeah. fleshed out yeah. how it might look yeah. like in the daily life of a community. Exactly so. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you bring heaven down on earth? Mm. Um, you know, there are some religions which see us as here on earth trying to climb to heaven, and Judaism exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, so that, for instance, you have these two acts of creation in the Bible, in the Mosaic books. God creates the universe, the Israelites create the sanctuary, the portable temple. And uh, the Bible allocates something like 20 times as much space to the Israelites building this little portable sanctuary mm -hmm. as it does to God creating the universe. So I tend to think of the Bible, which is the formative document of Judaism, not as man's book of God, but God's book of man. 
Mm. And so for a life to go well means following the call of God as articulated in Mosaic law, which is a way of etching everyday life with the charisma of holiness. That's a wonderful phrase, etching the everyday life with the charisma of holiness. That means uh, everyday life is given significance, mm. it's given weight, mm. it's given, uh, it's elevated. Yeah. It's a very remarkable structure if you read the Mosaic books. Um, eating becomes part of the code of holiness. Here are the foods you can eat, here are the foods you can't eat. Um, you shall eat and be satisfied and bless the Lord your God. So eating is a form of divine thanksgiving, but as a code of holiness. Uh, the same applies to the sexual life between man and woman. Again, in Leviticus 18 and 20, uh, a very, very intricate code of investing that love between husband and wife with a, a sort of discipline, a structure. Um, and turning it into, um, you know, prose into kind of religious poetry. I think that's the Jewish genius. Take an ordinary life in ordinary circumstances and make that a home for the divine presence. So, so uh, the, the code isn't about do's and don'ts mm. uh, primarily. It, mm. It's about that too. Mm. Uh, the code is about uh, a, a kind of focusing this uh, a, a kind of discovering this particular activity, the presence of God, and therefore, mm. what, heightening the both significance and enjoyment of that activity. Food becomes more than food. Mm. Sex becomes more than sex. Mm. Ordinary things of life are mm. more than they are, right? Yeah, exactly in, in so. Exactly so. How do you take an ordinary life yeah. and imbue it with the sense of the transcendent? You know, this is so con contrary to, say, uh, think of the, some of the critiques of, uh, of religion. I think something uh, happening in kind of Trail of Nietzsche, mm. uh, where uh, a kind of transcendence is not only, uh, that it's not just that, that, that you uh, have this resentment uh, against mm. the world and invoke transcendence, mm. but also somehow transcendence bleaches out ordinary life mm. of its significance. Mm. You know, typical example that people give, mm. Dante is uh, mm. being led through paradise by mm -hmm. Beatrice, mm. and Beatrice finally leads him in the presence of God, and then mm. this great love that motivated mm. the entire epic poem mm. uh, kind of disappears in the love of God. Mm. Uh, people think those who are oriented toward God somehow devalue the life of this world, including mm. the precious things like mm. our lives. But mm. you're saying something exactly opposite. It is extraordinary. If you read the Bible, this extraordinary library of books, the Hebrew Bible, composed over a period minimum of a thousand years from the earliest books to the latest books. And you will find a deeply religious people that almost doesn't talk about the afterlife at all. Yeah. It just talks about life down here. What is it to do, what is it to work? What is it to love? What, it is, what is it to construct an economy? What is it to build a politics around the presence of God in your midst? It is uh, relentlessly this worldly. Don't uh, search for God tomorrow, he's here today. Don't search for him up in heaven, he's down here on earth. Or at least, as in Jacob's dream, there's a ladder that connects yeah. heaven and earth. So we've started with a call mm. uh, of, of Abraham, call a transcendent call upon mm. our lives with mosaic uh, law. And I think we have etched ourselves slowly to mm. not just life being led well, mm. but to fundamental elements of life going well. Right? Mm. We are with food, we are mm. with sex, we are mm. building of community mm. and, and, and mm. economy and so forth. Mm. Right? So that element of life going well mm. is structurally important to, to Judaism uh, as well. Right? Absolutely. Abs yeah. Um, and um, somehow or other, um, there is this extraordinary passage in Deuteronomy which lists the curses, 98 of them, if you don't obey God, you know. And you work out what's, what's brought all this on, you know, what terrible sin have the Israelites committed? And the Hebrew says, All this is happening because you did not serve God with joy and goodness of heart out of the abundance of all good things. 
So um, the product of the life well lived is, is joy. Mm. So if we take this in our categories of uh, the three dimensions, mm. uh, the, the, would you describe joy as a kind of affect, uh, affective side of human life? Uh, so it, it is. But uh, what is really interesting is the secondary place of happiness in, in Judaism, and even happiness like eudaimonia is a, it's not quite the right word, but a private feeling. Mm. Uh, joy in Judaism, it's always done in the company of others. Mm. So it's not a private emotion that I feel, it's a kind of shared celebration. So joy appears in the Mosaic books in the context of husband and wife and love and family. It occurs in the context of society. Whenever you are celebrating, make sure that you include within your celebrations the widow the orphan, the Levite, the stranger. So it's an open, embracing kind of joy. Uh, I mean, uh, you wrote a book called Exclusion and Embrace, and we're very much into the embrace and against the exclusion, because yeah. everyone's got to feel included for a joy to be a really Jewish joy. Mm. So, um, so it's a kind of shared thing, it's interpersonal. It's also moral in that it's open and welcoming the stranger. And it is, um, in a sense, just taking life itself and saying that is the greatest gift of God. So whether our external circumstances are terrific or they're quite meager, uh, nonetheless, you sit and you rejoice. And you rejoice over some kind of a good, right? Uh, when I think of great, uh, great songs mm. of uh, joy in, mm. uh, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, mm. um, um, deliverance from, uh, from the slaver, slavery in Egypt, uh, there is mm. a, the huge celebration mm. that happens and that's ritually enacted. So it, it's a celebration of a good that has been experienced. Yeah, it's a celebration of uh, the move from slavery to yeah. freedom. It is a celebration really of um, what I think is really at the heart of Judaism, the sense of God as somebody very close. This is not a philosopher's God. This is a God who takes us by the hand mm. and leads us through the sea and steers us through the wilderness. This is a God in whose, into whose hands we entrust our spirit. This is a God who's, um, well, the Hebrew word for divine presence, shekhinah, Mm -hmm. is in secular language the next door neighbor. <laughs> so this is God as our next door neighbor. And so all, all the language, you know, God as father, God as husband, whatever you like, this is all non-metaphysical language. It's all a feeling of being very physically close to God. So, so joy is tied to this, this uh, uh, complex state of Closeness, it's joy over God's presence, mm. but over God's presence as a, a, a certain, almost states of affairs in the world. Right? Yeah. A if you start with, yeah, if you start with the assumption of Genesis 1, that every one of us, regardless of color, culture, creed, or class, right. is in the image and likeness of God. So if you're celebrating with your friends, and you're doing so in a joyous manner, in a sense, all our particular points of light join together and create a, a moment of uh, an epiphany of the divine presence. Mm -hmm. So the idea of being close to God is not opposed to being close to other people. It's something that happens when you're close to other people. About three, four weeks ago or so, I was uh, in Jerusalem and on the Shabbat, I mm. went uh, for a Shabbat meal. I went to my good friend, uh, Alon, mm. who was a rabbi, and uh, we had a meal uh, mm. together. And uh, after the meal, he took a, a, a book of a rabbi from uh, Jerusalem and read to me about mm. the significance of the Sabbath. Mm. And what struck me in that, in that, uh, in that book is connection between Sabbath, Shabbat and joy. Yeah. And um, I always thought of Shabbat as um, many other things, but kind of tied to, to work. Seven day you should, uh, six days you should work and, and then no work on, on Shabbat. But the point that was being made was 
it's the end not so much of work, but the end of striving mm. and celebrating what is. Mm. Um, uh, I, uh, th that was the, the, the kind of discovery for me. Uh, God creates the universe in six days and then yeah. he rests. We try and become his partners in recreating mm -hmm. or improving the universe for six days. So for six days, we're partners, we're side by side. On the seventh day, we too rest. And as Judah Halevi, our 11th century philosopher put it, it is as if you're guests at God's table. Mm. He's the host, we're the guests, and we're all no longer striving. Mm. And we're just celebrating one another's company. And that is why the Sabbath plays so central a part in this idea of a life worth living. Because, mm. you know, um, there have been many, many utopias in history, and the word utopia means no place. Mm -hmm. So I think the Sabbath is, in one sense, the most remarkable of all utopias, because it's utopia now. Mm -hmm. One day in seven, we're there. We're back in the Garden of Eden. We're back close with God. We are actually doing our dress rehearsal for the extended version to come at some time to be announced. So it's a, a kind of dress rehearsal for utopia. And mm. it's real and it's now. It's very interesting. I was reading just around the, 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 the same time, I was reading some of Augustine. And Augustine, mm. of, co of course, kind of appropriates, mm. as the New Testament mm. does too, the Shabbat mm. um, imagery for mm. the eschatological uh, mm. hope. And then Augustine speaks about sh Sabbath uh, as being kind of the end of all our desires. And mm. all our desires aligned in the right way mm. if they're aligned toward that Sabbath. And that kind mm. of resonates with yeah. what you're saying right now. Mm. And also it's kind of, you know, uh, was it uh, von Genap or uh, Victor Turner who spoke about liminal space? Mm -hmm. When you're neither there nor here, you're just in the middle. And when society disappears and community arises, and the mm -hmm. difference between society and community is society is hierarchical, but community is all of us as equals together, bonding together. And in the Bible, that's the 40 years in the wilderness. Hosea calls that a honeymoon between God and his people. Uh, you know, it was fairly uh, troubled and argumentative honeymoon, <laughs> but it was a honeymoon because they, they yeah. felt that God was very close. And I think that is what the Sabbath is. It's this time out of time, eternity in the midst of time, this liminal space. Because the thing about the Sabbath is not only don't you work, you can't ask anyone to work for you. Yeah. Every hierarchy is suspended. Even your domestic animals can't work for you. Yeah, yeah. So we're all back <laughs> in the Garden of Eden. No hierarchy, no dominance, no power relationships. And just celebrating the good of being, of yeah. being in God's being. You've also uh, written, uh, uh, as far as I remember, of a, a kind of a social conditions. Mm -hmm not just communal intentionalities and practices mm. associated with the Sabbath. That, mm. And that for that dimension of life worth living the Shabbat mm -hmm. is that you need a, a certain social states of affairs to mm. be the case mm. uh, for that to be celebrated really well. How, mm. how does our personal life worth living fit into the larger way in which we organize the society, the society as a whole? <clears throat> Obviously, the, the biblical project is a social project. It's the construction of a society built on justice and compassion, on social inclusion, on welfare, so that the poorest are not excluded. You have that uh, elaborate structure of the seventh year and the jubilee year when all property returns to its original owners, so that the inequalities that tend to build up in any economy are leveled once every seven years or once every 50 years in a slightly bigger way. So you can't ignore that social justice element that, that environs you, uh, and that's the task of the six days. But since we've never fully completed that task, we kind of renew our being together on the Sabbath, which kind of 
feeds into the rest of life because if you've sat with somebody and made Kiddush the blessing over the wine and you've broken bread together and you've established that fellowship, you can't really go off and exploit him the day afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's that, that crucial rhythm of, the, of, of Jewish life that links the transcendental and the social and political. I just think, incidentally, this is quite an important thing. You know, I, I wouldn't say the Greeks had a logical imagination, Jews had a chronological and dialogical imagination. Mm -hmm. Because there's certain mm -hmm. states of being that you need to enact at certain times, but not the whole time. Right, right. So you can't have a life that's all Sabbath until the end of history. Uh, that is the end of days. But so now we haven't really worked out outside of the Bible any way of factoring in this kind of these biorhythms mm. of a life worth mm. living. Mm. It, it isn't a constant state. It's got to have these things factored in and not through some personal time planning app on the iPhone because in Judaism, happiness and joy are not personal. They are communal. Mm. So you have to have everyone resting on the same day and pretty much in the same way. So there's the communal dimension. Too. So in some ways, uh, the, the, what's true of joy, uh, mm. that it is a communal mm. thing in Judaism, that might be true also, if I'm hearing you mm. rightly, also of life worth living mm. in general. It's not simply, obviously, uh, uh, individuals can strive and they can, mm. they can reach and their lives can get weight, mm. but it's, it's uh, in a sense, almost incomplete if it's yeah. in its own, right? Yeah. There's a communal um, a project. Sure. There is a, um, it's very striking in the Hebrew, uh, you know, because Hebrew is rather more elemental language than English. But you hear this litany of the seven days of creation, and God said, let there be, and there was, and God saw that it was good. So you hear mm -hmm. the word good seven times in Genesis 1. And then suddenly you hear in Genesis 2 the words not good, which only appear twice in the whole Mosaic books. And it says, it's not good for man to be alone. Mm. So you have a critique of our whole contemporary secular order. <laughs> and it was very interesting because a great Jewish theologian in America, Rabbi Soloveitchik, once wrote an essay called The Lonely Man of Faith. And it struck me when I first saw even the title, I thought, Nobody's ever written an essay like that before because in Judaism, the man of faith and the woman of faith are not lonely. <laughs> I mean, I once called faith in Judaism the redemption of our solitude. Mm, mm, mm. Makes, makes sense. Now, you wrote also uh, that Judaism is uh, a demanding religion. I think you somewhere wrote that it is one of the most demanding, if not mm. the most demanding uh, religion, in, and indeed, uh, that was the reason why you commended it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in part. But uh, so, so, so it uh, it may be hard. But what what reasons, what resources, what motivations does one have to follow the path, to be part of? Well, this the, project the, the, of the, life worth living. Yeah, this sense of being close to God um, is the summum bonum of Judaism, I mm. think. And you kind of feel that throughout the prophetic books. You feel it throughout the Song of Songs. You feel it throughout many of the Psalms. You know, somehow this sense of being, you know, from the depths I cry to you, O Lord, this sense of being distant from God is almost unbearable. And um, so that closeness to God is, is how it works out. But really and truly, um, it's a combination of three beliefs in Judaism. Judaism, I would say, is framed by three beliefs, creation, revelation, redemption. Those are the three fundamentals. So God creates the universe. He, at Mount Sinai, reveals his will for the people he has chosen as the people of whom he will be the exclusive sovereign. Mm. That's the first nation under the sovereignty of God, hence the profound ambivalence in Judaism towards monarchy, a mm -hmm. human king, mm -hmm. and even the profound ambivalence of the limit about the limits of politics, because really and truly, 
Judaism is a kind of utopian anarchy. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, we just live together under God and we don't accept anyone else as the ruler. So revelation is the code of God's will at, at directed to us as his particular people, even though he's God of everyone and loves everyone. And uh, when you apply revelation to creation, the result is redemption. Mm. And the journey towards that perfect society is the one that began with Abraham and still nearly 4,000 years later we haven't completed. In some way, if I'm listening rightly, what you're saying <coughs> uh, from the closeness to God to the kind of these three elements of, mm. of, of Judaism, it almost sounds as if this way of life is its own reward, uh, attachment to God, closeness of God, mm. is its own reward. Uh, uh, you can justify it or you ought not justify it on account of uh, some other greater good that it might do to you or something of that sort. Is that what I, you're saying or That's something else? That's certainly what I'm, I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and it comes out of this Judaism is a, a religion of protest, really. It's a protest against the world's first great empires. Mm. So you have this, uh, in a sense, that critique is there in Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, which we read as the first totalitarianism. And then you get Egypt. And what's wrong with Egypt is it's a society in which one human being is treated as God, and a lot of human beings are treated as slaves. So to create and inhabit a society where everyone is given their full measure of human dignity as the image of God is the setting for a life in which you feel close to God, not only in the mind or the soul or the emotions, but when you go out into the street, mm. especially you know, with the honesty and integrity of commercial and political relationships in the state, and also that serenity of a Sabbath where everything stops and in the still quiet at the heart of creation you hear and feel the presence of the Creator. So it's a complex mix of the individual, the communal, and the social. Mm -hmm. So well-being is really all of those things being in some kind of alignment. and. Beyond that, there's no further need for justification. Mm. So that that way of life understood in such a communal as well as personal way mm. kind of justify itself mm. by its beauty, by its mm. attractiveness or whatever that might mm. be. And you can sort of trace that throughout history because mm. there were an awful lot of occasions when people said to Jews, I mean, it happened under Christianity, it happened under Islam, not always, not even often, but enough to be part of our character, convert or die. Mm. Convert or be expelled. Convert or be persecuted. And with very few exceptions, the vast majority of Jews did not convert. Mm. So somehow, when every blandishment was offered and whenever th every threat was uttered, most Jews at most times actually felt being Jewish matters to me more than anything else. And so I conclude from that mm -hmm. empirically that Jews found this closeness to God in the company of, of your fellows is the summum bonum and you don't seek for anything else. Mm -hmm. And certainly when it comes to the search for wealth or power, we have this wonderful subversive book of uh, Ecclesiastes, the man who had it all right, and right. can only conclude by saying meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's the best critique of the consumer society and individualism that I've ever read. So uh, here was a man who knew it all, had it all, and says in the end, you know, in the end the most important things are Sweet is the sleep of a laboring man and see life with the woman you love. Which is curiously enough the same conclusion that that rather godless Jew, Sigmund Freud, <laughs> arrived at as well, work and yeah, love. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, especially if one uh, if one sees um, f f the 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 life worth living as uh, kind of its own reward, mm. and if it is demand demanding uh, but still having its own reward, what what happens when one when one fails? Uh, it's a tough tough road to to follow. I mean Abraham had a tough road. Everyone uh, to fails. Follow. Every, every, everyone fails. And everyone fails uh, in a small or large ways. There are no perfect characters in the Bible. Yeah. When there are people who are pretty close to perfection, and there are only two, one is called Noah, and the other one is called Job, um, it turns out to be not very good news to be almost <laughs> perfect, uh, because God is going to put you through some fairly tough situations. So. There's this sharp distinction in Judaism between divine perfection and human imperfection, mm -hmm. which means that God very soon learns to forgive. So Judaism is a religion of forgiveness. God empowers us to fail. I mean, look how many times Moses fails in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, look how many times the Israelites fail. So you have this great drama of Moses after the people a mere 41 days since they received, made their covenant with God at Mount Sinai, and they make a golden calf. I mean, this is the shock, horror of all anticlimaxes. And mm -hmm. Moses goes up. <laughs> Moses comes down and smashes the Ten Commandments and the tablets of stone, and goes back up and says, God, forgive them. If not, blot me out of the book you have written. You know, yeah. this really challenging thing where Moses secures divine forgiveness. And at that point, something interesting happens, what Max Weber called the routinization of charisma, you know, where, where, where Moses' experience up the mountain becomes part of the annual ritual in Judaism called the Day of Atonement, mm -hmm. which in the temple times was mediated by the high priest. But for the last 2,000 years, it's just us talking to God and asking for his forgiveness. So we have these 10 days, beginning with the New Year, culminating 10 days later in the Day of Atonement, which are the 10 days of penitence. When we look over our lives, we apologize for the things we got wrong. We try and make amends with people we've offended. And um, Judaism is a profound religion of apology and forgiveness. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, Alain de Botton, who is an atheist, wrote a little book recently called Religion for Atheists. In the first chapter, he says, Yom Kippur is the day of atonement. It's such a good idea. I think we should have four of them a year. <laughs> 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 so I think that, yeah, yeah. that constant access to divine yeah. forgiveness is what empowers us to strive and yet to fail, and then get up and try again. Um. Striving and failing is part of the story of uh, of a people and mm. of a person uh, mm. w w with God. Um, but in that story, also uh, God seems not only to forgive; God seems to chastise uh, as well. There is a there is a kind of a, a punishment side to things. What is the role of punishment? Uh, the role of punishment really is to um try and make sure that we don't do the following deal. I'm going to sin, I'm going to apologize, and I'm going to be forgiven. Mm. I'm sure you know the recent research. Uh, uh, you know, the, they got the book by Nazarian called Big Gods. There's been empirical research mm -hmm. on do people become kinder if they believe in a punishing God or a forgiving God? And the paradoxical answer is that if they believe in a punishing God, they are kinder, more forgiving, and more law-abiding. If they believe in a forgiving mm -hmm. God, they feel they themselves have got to punish, and they become less kind. Mm -hmm. Of course, you wrote very movingly at the end of your book on exclusion and embrace about divine vengeance. Mm -hmm. And you made the same point, that somehow, when you feel that a great wrong has been committed, if you can ask God to take vengeance, it means you don't have to. But nonetheless, this moral order is taken seriously by you as well as by 
um, presumably the wider society than in that. It's taken level. very seriously, and in the end, although all the prophets, Abraham, Moses, Jeremiah, Job, they all had problems with the divine justice of this world. Right, right. How come the wicked prosper? How come the righteous suffer? That's the key question in Judaism, and it, it's not brushed away by anyone. It's, it's the question raised by the heroes and heroines of faith. So, but at the end of the day, um, God does forgive even his enemies. This is the drama of the book of Jonah. Jonah is sent as a prophet to Nineveh, which is the military center of Israel's enemies, the Assyrians. So Jonah knows what's going to happen. He's going to preach repentance. They're going to repent. God's going to forgive them. And he does not want God to forgive his enemies. So he runs away, and then you have the little drama with the boat, the fish, the, the whole story. Mm -hmm. And he can't escape, so he goes and to Nineveh and says, 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed, and they all repent, and God forgives them all, and Jonah sits down and wants to die. I knew you were going to forgive them, God. You make me look like a fool. You said 40 days Nineveh will be destroyed, and you see you haven't destroyed it. So punishment is a sort of threat rather more than it's a reality. And I think history bears it out. There's some pretty nasty empires that tried to destroy Jews and the Jewish people, and mm. they are no more, and we're still here. So although there have been rocky moments for faith, I think in the end, um, you know, Psalm, Psalm uh, 92 just describes it. The wicked flourish like grass, but like grass they get mown down. The righteous are like a cedar tree, which seems to do nothing but eventually grows tall. Marx Horkheimer, yeah. after the World War II, has written this small book. I didn't translate it into mm. English, but I don't know the mm -hmm. English title. Sehnsucht nach dem mm. ganz anderem. Mm -hmm. Kind of the, the, the longing for mm. the other, meaning mm. of the divine, mm. uh, just so as to right the injustices mm. of the world, mm. uh, so that the uh, torturer will not uh, eternally mm. triumph over the vi mm. victim. Mm. But it's very clear in the Bible what's the work of God and what isn't the work of God. And as soon as prophecy ends, mm. you find Jewish law being much less punitive, I mean, mm. much more pacific, mm. as if they realize that you can only really wage a, a war against your enemies if God tells you to, and if you don't have prophets anymore, and we didn't after Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi in Second Temple times, then you just don't do that sort of thing anymore. You pray to God, and then you try and make peace with your enemy. We have covered a big range of topics from the call of God upon our lives mm. uh, all the way to dealing with uh, the failures uh, mm. to respond adequately mm. to this uh, call. I if, think if, if, you know, if I, I were to sum it up, I would say that the man who got closest to this, oddly enough, since he wasn't religious, and was um, Viktor Frankl. Mm. Viktor Frankl was a psychotherapist who went through yeah. Auschwitz, who tried to give people the will to live. And then after the liberation of Auschwitz, founded a school of psychotherapy based on his experiences there. And he called it the will to meaning. Mm. Man's search for meaning. And I think that's what Judaism is. It's a search for meaning, to say that somehow or other history is not just what Joseph Heller of Catch-22 called a trash bag of random coincidences blown open in the wind. Mm. And I think, for me, the image, I wrote a book called A Letter in the Scroll. Mm because our uh, holiest thing is the Torah scroll, which is the five mosaic books handwritten uh, by quill on parchment still to this day. And I think of meaning in Judaism. It's just each of us is a letter in the scroll. Now, all meaning is expressed in words, and all words are written in letters, but a letter on its own has no meaning. Hmm. So it has to combine with other letters to make a word, other words to make a sentence, other sentences to make a paragraph, and other paragraphs to make a story. So I think Judaism, the meaningful life, the life worth living, is the life suffused with meaning. And I am a little element of that. 
but I have to join to others to make a family, and my family has to join with others to make a community, and the community has to combine with others to make a people, and that people has to connect with all previous generations to continue that story. So in the end, all life is worth living because God is the God of life, and Moses' great final command was, choose life. But what really makes a life worth living is a life suffused with meaning. When you see your significance as a letter in the scroll because this Torah scroll missing one letter mm -hmm. is invalid. So you're invested with huge significance, but it's not just on your own. It's with horizontal relationships with other people and vertical relations with the people who came before us. What a perfect end, uh, way to end our conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.